So we are in a series uh, called Encounters with Jesus. This is week seven of that series. And each week we're just looking at real encounters that real people had with the real Jesus to get a better understanding of, of who Jesus is and the impact that these encounters had on their lives, ultimately because we each want to have our own personal encounter with Jesus as well. And so again, this is week seven. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Luke chapter 10. That's where we're going to park today is Luke chapter 10. And uh, this is the encounter between Jesus and Mary and Martha. Some of you may be familiar with them. I'm going to start at the end of Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 38. This is what the text says. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. So that is our encounter today. Uh, this story takes place in a village called Bethany. These are two sisters, Mary and Martha. And if you're uh, familiar with the rest of the Gospels, you may have heard about Mary and Martha before because they have a brother named Lazarus. And Lazarus is a very powerful and, and well-known story because it's the story where Jesus actually raised him from the dead. And, and so they've, uh, they have uh, multiple encounters with Jesus in the Gospels, but only uh, once in Luke's Gospel. And Luke is the only one who records this specific encounter. So in John's gospel, uh, we hear about Mary and Martha with uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. And then we also hear about them at, uh, when, when right before Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he was anointed at their house by Mary. And so that's the second anointing that takes place. If you were here earlier in this series, uh, we talked about the Pharisee and the sinful woman who anointed Jesus and wiped uh, his feet with her tears. Well, later on, Mary anoints Jesus and wipes his feet feet with her hair as well. And so uh, that's the Mary and Martha that we're talking about here today. They're good friends of Jesus. And so Jesus shows up at their house uh, to rest and to teach and to just relax a little bit. And so this encounter is only five verses long, which is actually really good for you uh, because otherwise you'd be here all day because we got a lot of baptisms and we got a, we got a sermon to get through. So this is really good for you, but there is still a lot to unpack in just these few five verses. So look at verses 38 and 39 with me again. As Jesus and his disciples, pay attention to that. So it's Jesus and his disciples, which would have been the 12 disciples at minimum, but most likely some others as well who came along with them. Jesus had 12 apostles, but then he had many disciples. Uh, they were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So Martha was the oldest sister. This was her house. She opened her house and said, Jesus, yes, you're my friend. I would love to have all of you to come into my house and, and to sit down, to relax, to enjoy yourselves and and to teach if you so desire. And so she opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, it's easy for you and for me to read that and just kind of read right through it without realizing what's actually happening here, because we live in a different context than the one in which they lived in. We're in the 21st century world in the West, where men and women show up to church every single week. They, they worship together. They study the word of God together. We have women in leadership in our church and, and men and women leading all over the place in the church. But in that world, in the first century Jewish world, this would have been very uncommon and most often frowned upon. It would have been considered socially and culturally unacceptable for a woman to go and sit at the feet of Jesus. That language, sit at the feet, is language of a disciple. And so anytime somebody was a disciple of their rabbi, you would hear them talking about sitting at the feet of their teacher, sitting at the feet of their rabbi, sitting at the feet of their master. And so Mary assumes the role of sitting at the feet of Jesus, which was a role generally reserved for men. 
And so it makes sense then that, that Martha gets a little bit frustrated. But before we get there, I just want you to think about the boldness of Mary here in this moment to say, it, it, it's my chance. It's my opportunity. I know what people think. I know what people are going to say. I know what they're going to assume, but I don't really care. Jesus showed up. He came to my house today. And so regardless of what anybody else thinks, I'm going to go and I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to place myself there and hope that he allows me to stay and to learn from him. That's some incredible faith and incredible boldness from her. And then Martha, we see, gets really frustrated by this. Look at verse 40. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. She's distracted. She's got all these responsibilities, all these tasks, all these things that need to be done. The expectation of the host, and particularly the woman in this situation, would be that she would prepare a meal for all of the guests that just showed up. So we're probably talking about somewhere between 15, 20, maybe 25 people that just showed up at this house that now she has to find a way to prepare a meal for them and take care of them and treat them with, with this radical level of hospitality. That was just culturally expensive of her. Now let's be clear, Jesus never told her to do this, but the world in which she lived and operated told her this was her expectation. And so she's distracted by all of these preparations that need to be made, and then she gets frustrated. And so she goes to Jesus. Remember, they're friends. John's gospel tells us that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They were friends. They were close with one another. So she can speak openly. She can speak honestly. She could speak candidly to Jesus. And so she goes and, and essentially tells him, I am very frustrated because I've been left all alone to do this work by myself. And she, she asked Jesus this really profound question. She said, Lord, don't you care? Lord, don't you care? So she acknowledges Jesus as Lord. She recognizes him as her savior, her Messiah, her authority in her life. The word Lord means you have authority over me, whatever you say I do. So she acknowledges him as Lord, but then she asks this question of him as a friend. Don't you care? Don't you care about me? Essentially asking him, don't you see me? Jesus, don't you see me? Do you not see what I'm doing here? How can you not see it? I'm struggling and you're not even noticing here I am all by myself. Don't you care? And let's be honest. I think if, if we're just going to be real with ourselves right now, all of us have found ourselves in that place at some point in our lives. We're, we're trying our best to honor God with our lives. And yet we feel kind of isolated. We feel alone. And, and we wonder, God, do you even see me? God, do you, do you even care? Like, like, can we just for a moment not play pretend Christianity? Like, can we just for a moment, just like set that aside and just be real that like we've all been in this place at some point where we're frustrated, where we feel like we're doing our part and we're wondering if God is going to do his part, where we feel like we're doing what God's told us to do. And yet for some reason, it's still not working out. We're doing what everybody else expects of us to do. And yet for some reason, it's not working out. And so we ask God, don't you care? Lord, don't you care? I love the honesty that we get from Martha here. Lord, don't you care? Before we get too critical of her, let's just recognize that this is real. It's easy to judge her and, and to elevate Mary and celebrate what she's doing and, and condemn Martha. But I, I think if we're being honest, all of us have found ourselves in that place at some point in our lives. Just really wondering, like, God, do you even care? Do you even care about my life? Do you care about my struggles? Do you care about what's going on in my life? Lord, don't you care? But then she goes from there to say, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? See, if you're not careful, it's, it's fine to ask God questions. He can handle it. It's fine to be real with God. But if you're not careful, we move from asking God questions to then blaming others for our problems. Lord, don't you care that my sister you see, this is her fault. If she would just stop sitting at your feet and pretending like she's a disciple right now and get up and step into the role that she's expected to fulfill, then I wouldn't be in this situation. Don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? It's very easy for us when we find ourselves frustrated in life to start pointing the finger at other people and blaming them for our problems. 
and then asking God why he's allowing other people to be the, the root and the source of our problems. Don't you care that they are the reason why I'm in my situation? Lord, don't you care? And then she goes from asking this question to blaming her sister to then watch this. Telling Jesus what to do. So she starts with Lord, your authority, and then she finishes with, I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm an authority. Tell my sister to help me. Now, I don't know about you, but in my life, it has never worked out well when I try to tell God what to tell someone else. Just Never has it worked out well in my life. Never turned out in my favor. When I move from you're in authority, you are Lord, and I'm here to serve you whatever you want. I'm here to surrender to you. When I move from that place, and it's, it's easy to move from that place very quickly, isn't it? I mean, here in just a couple of sentences, she went from Lord to now I'm Lord, and I'm going to tell you what to do. Tell her to help me. It's very easy to find ourselves in that same place. It's never worked out well in my life. Maybe it works out for you. It just never worked out well for me. Tell her to help me. And so I want you to watch Jesus' response here. Verse 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So this is, again, an honest conversation. We love to be able to, to go to Jesus with honesty. But we don't always love it when he comes back to us with the same amount of honesty. So, so Jesus meets her in this moment with compassion. And he also meets her in this moment with correction. Martha, Martha, I, I see you. I see you in your struggle. You are worried and upset about many things. He meets her with compassion. He doesn't condemn her. I want you to notice this. There's a, there's a, a massive difference between condemnation and correction. But in our cultural moment, this is so important for us to get this. Because we live in a world that loves compassionate Jesus. And doesn't want anything to do with corrective Jesus. We love the Jesus that sees us in our struggle, but we don't want anything to do with the Jesus that's going to correct us in order to help us up out of our struggle. And, and I, I understand why we find ourselves in that place. And I think there are a lot of reasons for it. And part of it is just the church's own fault. If you, if you look back in history, even in American Christian history, not that far back in our past, the church really emphasized the Jesus of correction. There was a whole lot of fire and brimstone and, and everybody's going to hell. And there wasn't a whole lot of compassion. And so then what happened is everybody kind of swung the pendulum all the way over to the other side where, where we just wanted to emphasize the compassionate Jesus, where we just want to talk about the Jesus who's just always going to meet us in our pain, who's going to meet us with compassion, but we didn't want to talk at all about the, the Jesus who's going to correct us when we're wrong. And I want to encourage you, it's not either or, it's both and. The real Jesus is both compassionate and he's going to correct us. That is the real Jesus. And so here in this moment, watch this, he... he Affirm, sir, I, I hear you. I hear your struggle. I see you. You are upset. You are worried about many things. But few things matter. Few things are needed. Indeed, only one. And then he goes on to say, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. I find that really interesting too because the, the text tells us that Martha goes to Jesus it doesn't say that Martha pulled Jesus aside. Again, we're, we're talking about a small house, probably one room big enough for all these people to be sitting in, 20, 25 people. And Martha goes to Jesus, interrupts him in front of 
the whole group and publicly shames her sister. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me here? Like, like how, how do we have this story? How do we know this happened? The disciples were sitting there. They would have heard this conversation. This wasn't a conversation that happened in private. This was a conversation that happened in front of everyone else. And so she, she tries to publicly humiliate her sister to shame her sister into having to get up and help her. And so Jesus says, no, no, because you brought this, this uh, condemnation forward publicly, now I'm going to have to gently rebuke you publicly. And so he says in front of everyone else, Mary has chosen what's better, essentially redeeming and restoring Mary. Mary has every right to sit at my feet, Martha. Every right to sit at my feet. I know what, what the cultural obligations say. I know what the societal pressure, pressures tell you. I even know what some of the law says. But can I remind you, Martha, that before the law was ever written, God said that he made them Male and female in his image, both equally bearing the image of God. And so this woman has every right to sit at my feet as my disciple as any man in this room. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. And then he says, Martha, you're, you're worried and upset about many things. You're worried and upset about many things. But only one thing matters. You're, you're worried and upset about many things. And in the process, you're missing the main thing. You, you, you are so distracted by serving me that you're actually missing out on spending time with me. You're so distracted trying to do things for me that, that you're missing your opportunity to sit with me. Mary has chosen what is better. Now, let, let me be clear. Jesus isn't saying here that serving is wrong. He's not saying that. He's not saying serving is wrong. He's not saying that serving is bad. He's not saying that serving is unnecessary. Actually, all throughout the Gospels and, and all throughout the remainder of the New Testament, we see the exact opposite. We're continually commanded to serve one another in love, to not use our freedom for ourselves, but to serve each other. Actually, in Mark chapter 10, verses 43 through 45, Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples about how the Gentiles like to lord their authority over others. And he's telling them, but this isn't how we're going to roll. This isn't how you're going to act. He says this, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the son of man, that's Jesus's favorite title for himself. Even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is saying, this, this is my mission, and therefore it's your mission. So he's, he's not saying that serving is bad or serving is wrong. He's not saying don't serve. What he is saying is that our serving should always come as a response to intentional, dedicated time with Jesus at his feet. If we're not spending dedicated time with Jesus, then our serving will simply become a distraction from Jesus. So it should be an outflow. Otherwise, we end up becoming people who serve, but without the heart of the God who serves us. Maybe you've experienced that before. Maybe you've experienced people who, who man, they pride themselves in all of the good things they do for God. But yet they're bitter, they're angry, and they never actually reflect the heart of God. And they become a terrible witness for Christ. And so I, I would rather you not serve than serve in that way. So what Jesus is, is saying here is, no, no, like, you, you can't do this on your own. The reason why you're overwhelmed, because you, you've been trying to do this all by yourself. You're trying to do this out of your own strength. And you just, you're never going to be strong enough. But on the other hand, if you would just come and sit at my feet and, and, and let me pour my love into you, let me teach you, let, let me prepare you. Let me equip you with everything that you need. Then you will be overflowing and you will be in a place to serve from, from a, a true heart of God himself. And so that's what Jesus is inviting Martha into here. He's not condemning her. I, I hope you catch that. He's not condemning her. And, and in a culture that desires to have a God that condones everything that we want, correction will always feel like condemnation. 
Because what we're looking for is a God who just says, whatever you want, do it. Whatever you desire, do it. Because we just want a God of compassion. He's going, no, I'm a God of compassion and correction. And so we've got to learn to embrace God's correction for our life as a good thing, as a holy thing, as a gift of love for us. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He says, Mary has chosen what is better. And every week of this series, we talked about how we don't want to just study these encounters and learn about somebody else's experience. We want to have our own encounter with Jesus. And, and, and Jesus is giving us the, the roadmap to have that encounter right here. It says, Mary has chosen what is better. Here's what this looks like. You've got to make sure that you are sitting at the feet of Jesus. You have to make sure that you are being intentional to sit at the feet of Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus, not just somebody who checks all the boxes and serves in all the ways so that you can feel good about yourself or feel like you're holier than somebody else, but rather you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, allowing him to fill you up and to equip you in every way so that you can then go and serve. That's what it means to choose what is better. It's not that Martha was doing something bad. It's just that she was missing out on something that was better. Jesus is going, I'm, I'm right here. I'm right here in your own home. And so, so let me talk about what this looks like practically. I want this to be as practical as possible for you. And I want to encourage you to actually write these things down. If you want to have real encounters with Jesus in your own life, write them down, jot them down, put a note in your phone so that you can remember this later on today, and then you can apply it in your own life. What does it look like to actually encounter Jesus? And here's, here's just four simple things. The first one is this. You've got to make sure that you're spending time in the word of God every day. Not just on Sunday, not just in this house, but invite Jesus into your own house. Spend time in your own home, in the word of God every single day. So we, we just entered into the Lenten season. Christians all over the world are preparing over the next 40 days for the celebration of, of Easter. And this is just a time where Traditionally, people will set other distractions aside. They may fast from certain things in their lives and prioritize spending time with Jesus. I want to encourage you over the next 40 days, there's 42 days between now and Easter Sunday, 42 days. And over the next 42 days, I want to encourage you to prioritize spending time in the word of God every single day. If you do not have a daily habit of being in the word, I would strongly encourage you open the Bible to the gospel of John. There are 21 chapters in the gospel of John. You can read it twice through by just reading one chapter a day now through Easter. And you can miss every other day and still complete the gospel of John if you would just read one chapter now through Easter. But prioritize spending time in the word. As a pastor, one of the most common complaints I hear from people is that they feel like they can't hear from God. I oftentimes will hear people say, man, I just, I don't know what God wants from me. I don't know what God wants me to do with my life. I feel like I'm not hearing from God. I feel like God is distant. I feel, I feel like I, I just can't hear him in my life. And my response to them is, is almost always, what does your time in the word look like? Are you spending time in the word of God? And nine times out of 10, the answer is no, or that it's not very consistent at all. And so my, my question back to you would be, if you're wanting to hear from God and yet you're not spending time in the word, then why do you think God would say something else to you when you won't even read the words he's already given you? Right. But like, like if you're, if you're not going to be into, God is a very good steward of all of his resources, including his voice. And, and so if, if you're, you're not going to take him up on what he's already given you, if you're not going to spend time in the Word, now listen, I'm not saying you have to spend an hour in the Word every day. I mean, praise God if you're there. But a, a chapter a day is five minutes of your time every day. To so spend five minutes of your time and just read the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active. It can transform every area of your life. So if you want to encounter Jesus, go spend time in the word of God. Spending time with Jesus will make you like Jesus and make you more like Jesus. So I want to encourage you to spend time in the word every day. The second thing I want to encourage you with is to spend time in prayer every day. Every day. Spend time in prayer. Again, this doesn't have to be long. I'm not suggesting that you have to spend an hour in prayer every day. Again, praise God if you can. 
But praying short, simple prayers and just honest, genuine prayers. You know, listen, get rid of all the churchy language. Get rid of all of it. God wants the real you. He can only heal the real version of you. He can only transform the real version of you. So be real with him. In the same way that Martha was real with him, she came before him and just said, Lord, do you care? If that's where you need to start, then start there. He would rather hear you complain to him than not hear your voice at all. He wants you to talk to him. So so spend time in prayer. It could be short, simple prayers. Pray for a minute at a time, a few times a day, and just watch what God does in your life. And not just talking to God, but also listening. I would highly encourage you before you go to the word every day to just pray briefly beforehand and invite the Holy Spirit to reveal what he wants to reveal to you in his word. And then after you're done reading to ask him again to teach you, to remind you, to show you what he wants you to know from the word. So spend time in the word every day, spend time in prayer every day. The third thing would just be to be in a small group. And I just want to celebrate this. As of right now, we have 581 unique adults in a small group in this church. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. But if you are not in a small group, all it is is just a group of people who are trying to pursue Jesus together, trying to encounter Jesus together. They're spending time once a week or once every other week, gathering together, studying the word of God, sharing life with each other, talking and and praying and encouraging one another. I highly, highly encourage you to jump into a small group. We still have groups available for you. There's still opportunities for you to get involved in one, but you cannot do this alone. You need community in your life. And then the fourth thing would be this, just to prioritize going to church every Sunday. Prioritize gathering with the body of Christ corporately every single Sunday. And I know that may sound like a crazy thing to ask when we don't even have room for the people who are here right now. I understand that. But this is so important. It's so central to your life. The the studies show that the average church attender, regular attender today, somebody who would be considered a regular church attender, attends church on average 1.7 1.7 times a month. And that 0.7, I assume it just means you came in like two and a half songs in. Like you were just a little bit late. <laughs> Showed up a little bit late. One point, so I don't know how they get that number, but 1.7 times a month. That's the average. I'm sitting here going, man, like, I, if, if you, can, you can love the Lord, you can follow him, you can be obedient to his call in your life with 1.7 times a month more power to you. I need it every single Sunday, man. The world is too chaotic for me. I've got too much brokenness in my own life. I need to be gathered together with the body of Christ, worshiping God together with my brothers and sisters, spending time studying the word of God together with my brothers and sisters every single week. And here's the reality. The world is full of distractions, lots of good things. Mary was distracted with many things. The world is going to distract you with many, many things. I want to speak again to the parents because we got a lot of young kids in this church. And here is the reality for you as your kids move out of elementary school and into middle school and high school is that Sunday is no longer sacred to our world. And so you are going to be invited into putting your kids into activities and, and sports and all sorts of things, travel leagues and everything else. That happens on a Sunday morning. And those things are good things. I'm not against those things. I've told you before, your kid's not going to the league. It ain't going to help. So I just, no offense, no offense. You're going to spend a whole lot of money trying to get your kid to the league. Just start a college fund, man. It's going to be better off for you and them. Just start that college fund and then go to church on Sunday. But, but, I, but I just want to be real because I see it. I see it coming. See, man, we got more than 200 kids in our church every single Sunday morning. We're in 200 kids here every single Sunday morning, and praise God for that. Yeah. Praise God for that. But if church isn't a priority for you, then it won't be even a consideration for them. You are determining right now, moms and dads, what is most important to you. You, are, you can say all you want that, that the kingdom of God is your highest priority. They're watching your actions. They're watching what you do and how you live your life. And so I'm just telling you, make it a priority. Every single Sunday, say, no matter what, we will be there. And also, can I just say this for just a moment? Just a moment. I was a youth pastor for a long time. And every now and then, I'd see this happen. And I'm not not trying to judge anybody, not trying to condemn anybody. I do do think there needs to be a little bit of correction here, though. Because every now and then, I would see a kid who would get in trouble at home, and then the, the 
punishment, the consequence from the parents was that they would tell their kid they can't go to youth group that week. That blew my mind. Well, they love youth group. You said, so you don't want them to? Well, what, what do you want? Well, I'm trying to teach them a lesson. What lesson are you trying to teach them? Like, if they're getting in trouble home, they need to be a youth group all the more. Like, never take this away from them. Take away their, their switch, their whatever, whatever, N Nintendo switch, right? That's what it is. Is that right? Is it your switch? That's the newest one, right? Okay. See? You know, made, me, made me worried I had the wrong. I'm, I'm, all, I'm on the trends, man. I know. Our kids are rocking with a Nintendo DS, baby. That's, that's, we got that old school, and, and they better be grateful for it, too. That's, that's all I have to say. Take that stuff away. Don't take church away from your kids. Don't take it away. Make it a priority. And, and if they're in trouble, then make them go all the more. And when they come home and tell you how much fun they had, celebrate with them. Celebrate with them that God is working in their life. But, but those four things, time in the Word, time in prayer, being in a small group, prioritizing church on Sundays, Tell you what, man, like you, you want to encounter God in your life. You got to spend time sitting at the feet of Jesus. And finally, I want to say this. There are probably some people who are here today or tuning in online who you don't feel like it, that, like you're worthy to sit at the feet of Jesus. And maybe some other people have told you that that's not your place. Maybe some other, other people have told you, no, 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 like that, that's not for you. And I want to encourage you to, to be a Mary and say, I don't, I don't care what anybody else says. He said, I can stay. He, he said, I can sit here. And his word is the final word. So if, if you're here and you feel unworthy, listen, Jesus has already said he's paid it all. He's paid the price. He said, you, you are a son and a daughter. You are created in the image of God. And he wants nothing more than for you to sit at his feet and to learn from him and to be his disciple.